All right, there you go. So like I said, we're kind of affectionate of Bigfoot. We're kind of related to him. He said the movie Harry and the Hendersons. We, uh, we kind of like that guy. So you got to watch him out here in the Northwest. You never know what's going to happen. It's part of one of our goals is to help you uh, expect the unexpected. We do actually have a lot of critters that run. Not too many Bigfoots, but uh, we do have a lot of critters that run across the road out here. So secrets for safer and happier driving. And Rich mentioned he's going to do the spin the wheel thing. And uh, he'll be letting me know when that's going to happen. So let's go ahead and jump into this. So my personal goal for you after attending the seminar is you have a better idea of the condition of your coach and know what symptoms to be aware of. Reveal some secrets to help you achieve safer and happier driving. If you're not sure, then try to connect you with the right people to do a proper inspection or for a road performance assessment is one of the things that we recommend. So I always like to take a time out to mention my folks who helped us start the business. My dad moved up in 1961 from Fort Bragg, California. He was trying to find a business that he could teach his sons, let them at least have a trade. And so he found this shop connected to a house. And we at that time had eight kids in our family, John, my little brother, who's very much part of our business, wasn't born yet. He was born in 66, but grateful for my mom and dad. And uh, he did um, teach us a trade. He served in World War II. He flew fighter bombers and D-Day and the Battle of the Bulge, things like that, 69 missions. So any of you folks that have served, I appreciate you putting it well and put your life on the line for our country. Thank you for that. So, but, you know, when I was uh, 16, 17 years old, I didn't think my dad knew that much. So uh, it was amazing. But by the time he got to, I, I got to 21, it was amazing how much smarter that my dad got. So um, great. My parents are both gone now. I miss them very much. But so... At that time, when I didn't think my dad knew much, I had my 55 Chevy. So I wasn't really interested too much in steering and suspension. It was more like my big brother was a drag racer and a hot rodder. So I towed it down, built a balance and blueprint small box Chevy for a four speed Muncie transmission. It ran really good. And one day, uh, about 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning, we started drinking slit malt liquor and Southern Comfort and smoking dope before it was legal here in Oregon. <laughs> anyway. So we made one pass through the country. We made it. We were out ripping around the countryside, and it got dark. So you know what? Then it's time to come to cruise the gut, right? So we come to town, and made one pass through town. Made a left hand turn, got on the throttle, couldn't stop, and I smack hit the car in front of me. He gets out and looks. It didn't hurt his rig any. Just broke out my left front headlight. So naturally, I throw the keys in the seat and say, "Buddy, we're walking home before I kill somebody or ruin my car." Uh, that's what I should have done, but that's not what I did. I took off. Instead of going back through town, I went straight across in a 25-mile, 20 or 25-mile-an-hour zone, wide open, banging the gears off, and just hit third gear, probably 65 to 75 miles an hour. And a kid I went to school with backed out right in front of me. And I should have been dead. I could have killed a bunch of people that night. In fact, that's just a miracle I didn't because the car went off the road to the right back on the road to the left, just as precision. It was on an old fashioned slot car set like some of us guys probably had when we were kids. And I, at that time I had air shocks on the back of it, had it jacked up with shackle hangers on the back the way I, when I got it, didn't have any anti-sway bars on it. And it did what it shouldn't have done. I had no seat belts in it. I wasn't macho to wear seat belts during the seventies. So the force was so violent, like almost threw me right out of the seat. And I'll never forget as long as I live looking in that little rear view mirror and going, seeing this giant cloud of dust and going, whatever happened there, it, I don't know what it was, but it was a totally wasn't me driving. There was people everywhere. It was actually a party. I could have killed a dozen people that night. Well, I slowed down, went home that night. But later on, many years later, about 10 years later, I became a follower of Jesus Christ. I found this verse in the Bible. It says, angels, my paraphrase, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, angels have to keep knuckleheads like me alive long enough to come to know Jesus as your, as your, as your Savior. I said, that's what happened that night. And so one of the things we ask people is that in the event of emergency, would you like to know what your vehicle is going to do? And most people say, yeah. They, they would like that. And so that's one of the things we ask people, and we do what we call a quick lane change for that reason. Okay. And uh, anybody have this experience driving something? I was really frightened the first time, and, and then going through it this time. Is I was like, actually driving that truck. 
little bit yeah. different. It's just incredibly different for me because it was that scary. I was really frightened the first time, and, and then going through it this time is like no big deal. So the secret number one, what you don't know can hurt you. I wasn't expecting that thing to be that bad. It's like driving a basketball the way it bounced back and forth. The heavy-duty Dodge 110 truck, dual wheels on the back of it, and he did have a set of airbags on it. But he put his airbags on there with an onboard air compressor, bringing both of the lines up to the cab with a cab control, and it was allowing that air to transfer back and forth from side to side. And so what you don't know can definitely hurt you. That thing was, was like driving a basketball originally. And uh, this is another example of what you don't know can hurt you. It's a semi with a dash cam on, motor home trying to pass him, pulls over to the right, all of a sudden left front tire blows, and there it goes. You can see the coach rolls over. And uh, that was a pretty new chassis. I believe that was a Freightliner diesel pusher. So one of the things that we like to look at is anything that's potentially could improve your safety on the road out there and try to make the invisible visible for you. And this picture I actually got from a customer at a FMCA rally and he took it, the gentleman who took this picture was actually in a um, gurney, a stretcher, and you can see down on the left there, there's his wife laying there. She was still laying there. They blew a tire. And the reason I wanted to bring this picture up to you is because this man who owned this motorhome maintained a fleet of trucks. That was his occupation. He was a professional who maintained a fleet of trucks. He knew the condition of his tires and everything, what it looked like. But um, I've had tires with uh, really low miles on them blow unexpectedly. So that's one of the safety things we like to address. We like to use the, the, the right products for doing that. And here's some, some pictures of uh, vehicles with the safety plus blowouts. You see how they're able to maintain their stays straight. This one I like because they stay in their lane around a corner as the tire blows. That to me is really impressive. Okay, in the beginning, why the RPA exists, and that's my brother John. We first started doing motorhomes. Back in the uh, 80s and um, early 90s, we would do one job one day and do the same job the next day. First day turned out great. Second day, same chassis, just a different box on the on the uh, chassis, and we got different results. And we hated unmet expectations. We go, whoa, timeout. We got to figure out what in the world's going on. Why does why did that one coach turn out so good? Do the same exact thing, same the next day, and different results. So we didn't want that. So we had to figure out what were the common denominators that were really important in terms of handling. Okay, what is a road performance assessment? Well, first, the goal of a, of a RPA, for short, is to optimize safety and handling characteristics with optimum comfort. That's what we're trying to achieve. So question, if there's anything you can do to make your coach handle safer and run better, would you be interested? Say yes. Shake your head or thumbs up. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about why the RPA. We mentioned that a little bit, and we'll mention it's a 3D process, a discovery phase, diagnostic, and delivery phase. And we'll go over some of the top 10 handling problems. I'm not sure if we'll get through all of them or not, but we're going to mention some of the more common ones. So how to avoid unmet expectations. When you run a coach through the road performance assessment process, you'll know what outcomes to expect from the modifications before you begin the repair. and no one likes surprises unless they're, unless they're fun surprises. I like birthday surprises. I like anniversary surprises. But I don't like surprises when I get behind the wheel of the vehicle and uh, something didn't turn out so good. And we don't like it either. We like to have uh, happy, satisfied customers. So we need to know what it is we're dealing with. So how would you feel if you went to the doctor, had a hurt toe, and he told you without even really looking at it that it was bad and immediately needed to be removed? you probably might want to get a second opinion, right? And that's kind of the way it is with a lot of folks. When we take a vehicle into something, you tell somebody you got a problem, oh, let's throw some, let's throw some shocks on it. Let's throw this at it. Let's throw that at it. And I don't like anybody throwing anything at my, at my motor home. I like to know why I'm putting it on, what I can expect for it, and what's it going to do for me. Why do I really need this? So what's lacking is an accurate diagnosis. We say that's the difference between a problem solver and a parts changer. 
I want to show you this. Uh, for, uh, mo how many people uh, see motorhomes pulling the wheels the, off the ground? Now, for many of you that have had drag racing experience, you know that it takes a lot of horsepower to pull the front wheels off the ground. I can guarantee you that this motorhome is not pulling the wheels off the ground because it has a lot of horsepower. It has something to do with weight distribution and how that coach was put together at the factory. That's one of those secrets we want to talk about. So what are some of the common denominators that affect how a RV is going to handle? So we look at things like aerodynamics. Aerodynamics basically have a big, they have a big effect on anything. You're like driving, you're like driving a billboard down the road. Have you ever uh, had a piece of plywood out in a little bit of a breezy day trying to carry it? Got a little breeze, it just really shoves you, doesn't it? So aerodynamics are important. The height is important. The width is important. How much overhang do they have past the uh, width of the track? What is the length of the coach? Most coaches that are in the uh, 26 to 28 foot uh, motorhomes have more handling problems than the longer RVs. Same thing's true on a diesel pusher. We'll usually have more handling problems on like a 32 foot diesel pusher as, a pair, as compared to a 40 foot. The amount of overhang in relation to the wheelbase is very critical. On that last slide we showed you with that front end jumping off the ground, I can guarantee you that he's got a lot of overhang in relation to the wheelbase weight distribution where do they put the tanks a lot of times our tanks are back behind the axle our water tank our fuel tank and our generator quite often will be behind the axle so that's acting like a big lever back there trying to pick those front wheels off the ground so you're driving down the road and a truck passes you and it feels like it wants to change lanes so that's a good that's a good sign you don't have proper weight distribution so Again, I mentioned these early, we start out with the discovery phase where we want to know what your complaint is. Every person is different and every coach is different. We want to treat you as an individual and we want to treat your coach as an individual. There's so many varieties of floor plans, wheelbases and overhangs and everybody has their own driving preferences. What might drive somebody crazy might not be a big deal to somebody else. So first we did the discovery phase. And then we move into a diagnostic phase, trying to diagnose what's going on with it. And then the third phase is the delivery phase, where you tell us what, if anything, you'd like to do about it. And then we go ahead and make those changes and go back out. And at the end, we'll go back out and verify we got the changes we were looking for. The form we use is going to look something like this. We're going to be measuring the amount of overhang in relation to the wheelbase. We're going to look at this percentage here. And this is uh, better than the average. The average gas coach is about 66% overhang. Average diesel, about 50%. We're gonna look at that. We're gonna look at the weight ratios. What's the rate weight ratio? This number here on a, most class A coaches, we wanna see a minimum of 50% or more on the front axles. If we get down below that on class A's, and it's even worse on a workhorse, with any workhorse owners on here, we have to run at 55% or more to get proper handling because the front axle is so far forward. Class C's, we can run it down quite a bit less than that. We can get down closer to 40, 45%. They don't have the big body work up front. It's more like a smaller area for wind on the front, so we don't have to run as much on those. We also tell you where your tire pressure should be set based on the load that you're carrying. And you can see down here, we rate everything, all these steering and handling characteristics, including how the brakes work, we rate it on a scale of one to 10. After we get done making any changes that um, the owner authorizes, then we go back out and we re-rate it again after that. I don't know what the customer's concerns are. In this case, it's blown around by trucks, passing, sways a lot and going around turns, constant, correct, constant steering correction needed, rut tracking, white knuckle driving. So we want to get it on a variety of, uh, uh, we want to get it on a road, course it has a variety of some highway roads some back roads some curves some bumps some of the real world conditions because you know what we find we find that on a flat smooth road with no wind no trucks no ruts almost any motorhome drives fine but it's when you get in the real world with the real kind of highways that we have to deal with and real wind conditions that's when all this stuff starts making a difference bumps potholes and scales are a very important part of the rpa process so we like to, we're going to get those individual wheel weights and we're going to look at those numbers side to side, front to rear and determine uh, where the tire pressure is, what the weight ratios are and everything else. So 
What about you? What are some of the unique steering and handling problems you're experienced with your motorhome or RV? Poor returnability, that's a big one. We'll talk about it. Sway, rut tracking, steering wheel play. How about pull, vibration, alignment problems, tire wear, brakes, lane change, road wander, engine performance, noise, Goodyear tire pressure specs. Here's any of you, uh, your major tire manufacturers will have charts that you can download off the internet and they'll tell you how much air pressure you should be, be carrying based on a wave. Not too many coaches have a 9R225, but you would find your tire size and you would go down here and you say, if you only have 3,370 pounds load on that tire, you only need to have 70 pounds in it. But you can see at 4,500 pounds, 4,540, it should carry 105 in it. What we quite commonly see is the tire stores have a tendency to over inflate the tires. That makes them ride harder, so you feel every bump. It also makes them have home more of a tendency to wander around in the ruts. So getting that weight uh, to match the uh, tire pressure to match the weight is very important. It can have a, a dramatic effect on how it handles, and it can cause safety aspects if you're not carrying enough tire pressure uh, for the load that you're carrying as well. And one of the things that we always like to do is check for unusual tire wear. And on some, like this one here we're looking at, you can see how the, the dual sidewall spacing is incorrect. We're almost touching each other. And we've seen cases where we've had blowouts because the sidewall spacing is incorrect and the tires rub against, uh, against each other and cause a sidewall to blow, causing the tire to blow out. Here we have some tire, we have some scuffing going on here. Most likely we have some incorrect alignment. And we can also get some tires that do what they call channeling. You'll have a section worn, and then it'll be good for a while. Then you go along, you have another section worn. And that can actually be a tire issue itself. Here, this looks like more of an alignment issue. It's more on the inside. And I, this picture here, uh, how many miles do you think are on that tire? Actually, it only had like 500 miles on that tire, and it was blown out. I was came alongside the road out in the middle of nowhere in uh, uh, Nevada, coming through Denio Junction, coming back up into Oregon through the back road. And this lady was alongside the road. She was by herself. And I stopped and she was saying, oh, those darn Continental tires they put on my coach aren't any good. Well, when I got underneath there and looked at it, I realized that this thing had some major alignment problems. It was towed in. Somebody had just aligned it. They didn't want to admit it. It wasn't on her bill, but I saw the witness marks on the tire oh. sleeve. It was towed in over an inch. And one eighth of an inch of excess toe ends equal to 28 feet of side scrub per mile. Very important. So secret number two, we're going to mention brakes briefly. I don't have a lot of time to cover any of this stuff. I could spend an hour on each one of these subjects. So I'm covering stuff pretty quick, but I'm going to mention a couple things on brakes. Understand your brakes before you need them. So one of the things about brake, if you have a pedal pulsation, that's that could be a sign you have rotors that are warped or out. Something's getting hot because it's been warped. And now you got a pulsation when you step on the brakes or somebody torqued the wheels down incorrectly. A brake pull, you could have something causing that, uh, a caliper sticking or brake shoe sticking. Something smells hot. We ran in the other day, a customer had a diesel pusher and the uh, I smelled something hot off the right rear wheel. And sure enough, he had a caliper that was hanging up and it was a special caliper that requires a clay base grease it's a special grease that's got a clay base on a that's on a diesel pusher motor home and that lubricant is hard to come by and somebody put the right kind of lubri wrong kind of lubricant on it noises um, if you have a if you have a noise and you think it might be your brakes step on the brakes and see if the noise goes away starts or changes pitch if you hear a difference in it when you apply the brakes, then it could be like a, a pad, a little bit of drag on a pad, a caliper, hardware might be broken or something along that line. But if it changes when you apply the brakes or starts when you apply the brakes, and you know that noise is probably brake related. If it doesn't make any difference when you apply the brakes, it's probably coming from something else. Um, let's see. Why do I need a tow brake? Well, uh, all it takes is just a 3,000-pound a tow car on the back of a motorhome, let me ask you a question. If you could stop your vehicle five feet shorter in the event of a panic stop, how much damage do you think you could do to the back of a 
Toyota station wagon with a carload of kids in it. I think you appreciate that five feet. And um, a few thousand pounds at 60 miles an hour becomes like 50,000 pounds of push when you're in a panic stop. Exhaust brakes or diesel pushers, most of them have it. You need to make sure they're working properly. We find a lot of the exhaust brakes have problems with them. There's some upgraded exhaust brakes you can put on that have more of a variable rate that will close down tighter as the speed uh, drops off. Newer, newer rigs have the exhaust brake built into the uh, turbochargers, so it's, they're different nowadays. But, uh, what, some of the enemies of braking systems is heat, excess heat. Water and brake fluid can cause the brake fluid to, to boil at a lower temperature. Then that fluid turns to a gas and your pedal drops to the floor. Overloading can uh, be an enemy of your brake system. You just don't have enough brake there to carry the amount of weight. Improper driving, if you're not downshifting properly, not using your exhaust brake right, or something's not functioning correctly the way it should, your tow brake's not working right, can cause problems. If you have bad brake fluid that's got excess contaminants in it, moisture in it, that could cause problems as well. And here is a picture uh, I took of a gentleman who had had the brakes upgraded on his uh, workhorse motor home, but I saw he was getting pad transfer. So the pads were getting so hot, it was transferring material into the rotor. And I, what I told him, I, I suspect that one of the calipers he put on there is uh, hanging up and it's sticking too much and causing this problem here. This other slide over here, we took this, uh, this is on a, I believe this was on a Roadmaster chassis. He had a crack that was completely through the rotor. He did not know he had that at all. We were doing an RPA and we were checking it out and we discovered that on it. And one of the things that you can do as an owner is invest in one of these uh, heat guns where you can go around and check the temperature of your tire wheel assemblies, your brakes, and tell you what the temperature is on, on each side. So if you got one wheel that's starting to get hotter, it could be a sign that you've got a brake hanging up. Also, you could catch if you have a, a wheel bearing that's going out, that could cause it as well. Uh, brake fluid testing should be done periodically. This is one of the test strips. We're actually using this to check for contaminants in the brake fluid that can cause problems with your ABS system. We also test the boiling point to see what boiling point. I don't have a picture of that here, but we actually boil a sample of your fluid to see what temperature that fluid is going to boil at, to see if it's going to hold up under a high heat and some of the mountains. We just got back from a trip over to Idaho, and there was four runaway truck ramps on that particular grade that we went down uh, north of uh, just north of Boise going up Highway 55 there. So secret number three, this is uh, whoever steers the least wins. My cousin Jerry Henderson had a professional kart racing school down in Southern California for many years. Uh, unfortunately, lost him to lupus, but he, he had a saying that he said, he said, whoever steers the least wins. And I believe that's true also in an RV, because when you're working that steering wheel back and forth, it's exhausting, it's tiring. It's also scrubbing speed off because your wheel alignment's changing as you're working that wheel back and forth. You're causing uh, more tire wear as well. So one of our goals, and we call our aftermarket part super steer because we're very concerned about the amount of play people have in steering, what we can do to eliminate as much of it as possible. So secrets to controlling steering play. And you know, our cars have rack and pinion steering in them. So they're very, very quick, very fast steering. And we have basically zero play in them. So what causes that? You can have loose parts. You can have a steering gear that's out of adjustment. Many of our steering gears are adjustable and you can adjust the play out of them. You have to be careful with that because you can cause other problems if you don't know what you're doing when you're adjusting them. A lot of the steering gears are out there are not adjustable like the Shepard steering gear and the ZF steering gear. And they're, I call them what you see is what you get. So you can get a great steering gear or you can get a bad one right out of the gate. Quite often, most steering gears, if there's a problem, they're usually bad from the get-go. So if you buy a new vehicle, a new coach, and you feel like there's, there's a lot of play on this, you ought to get it checked because there's a possibility you could get that gearbox replaced under warranty. 
We make a part called the Super Steer Bell Crank. It was the first part we ever made for the General Motors P chassis. And we went to a tapered roller bearing design instead of a bushing design, which eliminated all the play out of it. This one over here is for the Freightliner XC chassis. We use, again, double tapered roller bearings to replace the bushing design that Freightliner uses on those. Bell crank arm, we have these that are tighter, less movement. Actually, the one for the driver's side actually has bearings in it. It's adjustable. We sell a lot of those still. Even to this day, we still sell a lot of those. But anything that has play <clears throat> could be – actually, I ran into the nut here on the steering wheel loose. One time I was out driving a lady's motorhome, and I felt something hit my foot. And I looked down, and it was a nut. And she had a custom steering wheel from the factory on it. It had about 10 bolts on there, and about half of them were loose and uh, ready to fall out of there. And I said, well, if you keep driving it like this, you're going to have your friend. Do you want to take the wheel? You'll be able to take it and hand it to him. <laughs> so um, anyway, want to look? we look for play at any point in that system. Wow, that computer is touching. Okay, so the other thing is we, we run into is returnability. This is probably one of the most neglected things that I see in our aftermarket steering alignment and suspension industry is how well does the vehicle come back to a center point? We do what we call a flick test. I'll flick the wheel to the right. It dives right, but does it come back straight? Flick it left. Does it go left and come back straight? Does it favor one side more than the others? And we'll test this at varying, our, at varying speeds. We'll start out at low speed and then go on to high speed and test it. So it could be a steering gear adjustment. It could be over adjusted, like I said earlier. It could be an alignment problem. It could not have enough caster. It could be sticky parts. We run into some parts when they're brand new. They're so good. They're built so tight. They'll last for a million miles, but they're so tight. It takes you 200,000 miles to break them in. So it can be that problem as well. So you have to be careful with some of the aftermarket parts people put on, like ball joints and some of the tie rod ends or drag links if they're too tight. And another complaint we get is road wander. And you're going to see some overlap in these things because we're talking systems and systems do overlap. So what causes road wander? Could be, again, steering gear adjustment, could be alignment problems, and could be weight distribution. I want to mention that weight distribution there because that definitely can cause them to be wander in the ruts and the wind. Uh, and you get a truck that passes you and it feels like it wants to change lanes. That could be a sign that you do not have enough weight on that front axle. One of the things, some of the things you can do to help control that is to install a steering control unit. <clears throat> I want to mention that there's some really good steering controls on the market, and this is one that we've been using since 1989. It's called the Safety Plus. It has a hydraulic cylinder to absorb high-impact blowouts, but it also has a spring that's preloaded under constant compression, which brings it back to an exact center point. Very positive center and really helps you keep track and straight. One thing I will say is that you can mask an existing problem. You want to be careful if you're going to put one of these on that you're not covering up another problem. I was out doing vehicle inspections at a rally in Florida a few years back, and I looked at a guy's rig, and he had no complaints how it drove, but I noticed that it had a pretty severe tow-out problem. <clears throat> and I asked him um, if he'd had any complaints. Nope, nope. I said, do you realize your tires are wearing out? And he said, nope. And because that steering unit was on there doing such a good job, he was wearing his tires out. And he didn't even know it. So be careful when you install one of these that you're not covering up an existing problem. <clears throat> well, this is on a Ford F53 motor home. And we own one of these. And they're sometimes some of the worst handling problems are on these Ford F53 gas chassis. And you'll see the spring moving in and out, back and forth. The leaf spring, this is a, the left front leaf spring on that chassis. And also see the bushing moving a lot up here. How much plays in that bushing? So we had our motor home handling really good. But when I went down the road, I still felt like I was moving the steering wheel a lot. And I told John I knew what was going on because we could see it when we were doing our inspections. We knew those springs were wrapping up. We knew they were moving in the bushings. And so what we did was John built a radius rod kit for it, which attaches to the axle and goes up here to the frame in the front. And it really helped it out a lot. We found out that it also helped control sway and body roll, which I didn't expect it to do that. But we found these leaf springs were narrow. They're only a three inch spring on a 24 and a 26K Ford. They're only three inches wide. 
the, the 22 K they're actually four inches wide, but nonetheless, there's a lot of movement in these bushings and they were twisting. So we found out they helped control steering play, wind buffeting, road wander and rut tracking. And this is a brand new product for us. We've just started production on these and we've had some Ford owners that were absolutely thrilled about that. <clears throat> we're also showing here our new super steer anti-sway bar. We take the original Roadmaster sway bar, take all the heat treat out of it and bring it down to zero. And then we bring it up to a through heat treating the whole way through the whole bar. And it's about 30 to 40% stronger than the Roadmaster inch and three quarter bar. We've rechanged all the end links on this and we build them a new one for the rear that's actually a two inch anti-sway bar with uh, heavy duty shackle hangers on it as well to help control that, that sway that you get in and out of driveways. You can never before expect the unexpected. So how many have been driving along? All of a sudden you got a big heavy blast of wind out of nowhere and you didn't see it coming. Anybody besides me have that happen. I wish my wife was here to tell her story. Uh, we got a just a terrible wind came out of it in Nebraska one time. In fact, it blew a uh, trailer and took out the, the whole road was shut down because it took a semi and waited across the road there in uh, Nebraska, just out of, outside of Winnebago, Nebraska, which is not where they build the motorhomes, but expect the unexpected. So crosswinds. Trucks passing, that's the other one. And for trucks passing that way, we find that the little air tabs, I don't have any pictures of those on here, but we find that the air tabs work uh, especially good in that area for on the aerodynamic side of things. And uh, you can look that up online. Actually, I do believe John carries them in stock at Supersteer if you're interested in them, but they do help on the aerodynamics. They uh, reduce your drag and uh, help uh, fill that vacuum that's behind your motorhome that causes uh, the interruption when somebody comes up behind you or when you driving down the road. So track bars and steering stabilizers. We haven't mentioned track bars yet, but track bars help keep that axle on center and uh, help with uh, rut tracking and tire blowouts, <clears throat> reduce driver fatigue. That's a product that we're most famous for is our track bars that we sell. An uh, awful lot of those on the Class Cs, the pickups, the um, um, Class A motorhomes, and uh, so those are real important. Uh, okay, secret, let's move on to sway. So we call this, the affectionately call it the Walmart wobble, pulling in and out of Walmart <laughs> driveways. You get that kind of side movement. And with an anti-sway bar, you can see what's happening. This coach is going around the corner. The centrifugal forces are pushing the wheel down on this side. At the same time, it's trying to lift over here on this side. So what an anti-sway bar does, it's the, the diameter of it's important because the larger the diameter, it's going to hold, want to hold this wheel from lifting up off the ground. For every eighth of an inch, you increase your sway bar diameter, you get another 30% more roll stiffness. <clears throat> so inadequate sway bars can cause sway, weak springs can cause sway, worn out shock absorbers, bad sway bar bushings can cause it. We see quite a bit of sway bar bushings just given out under these all the pressure, especially on the Ford Class A. There's so much sway in that particular chassis. The lack of air spring control can cause it. So anti-sway bars, we use a lot of the Roadmaster products. They make an excellent product for controlling sway. And like I said, on the Ford, we are having um, sway bars built to our specs on that one. Here you can see the difference in diameters. We'll, we'll make some big increases in diameters. Like on the Ford F53 chassis, we go from an inch and a half on the back to two inches. So we're in, improving the uh, sway by about 120% more resistance in that sway bar than the factory one. Also, we make coil springs that are higher spring rates to help control sway. Shock absorbers are important. They do help control motion. Some shocks have a lot better rebound control which we find with the tapered leaf springs or air suspension, it's important to control the rebound on those. We wanna have it soft on the way down, but have more control on the way back up. Motion control units on the airbag, like I mentioned earlier on that Dodge pickup, to help keep the air from moving in and out of the airbags, these installed next to the airbag. We wanna keep these, we, the goal is to try to keep them within six inches from the airbag. They will work even at a further distance, but the goal is to try to, Limit that movement as quick as we can so it doesn't unload one side and load up the other side. 
simple to install, good clean cut, got to check them for leaks once they're installed. Uh, a guy called me and said his dolphin was porpoising. So we uh, <laughs> we said he had an identity crisis. There. <laughs> so what helps control porpoising? The proper shock absorbers, worn out shocks or the wrong shock absorber. A shock that doesn't have enough on the rebound side will typically cause more porpoising. Harsh ride, this is another one. We get a lot of complaints about that. Hard ride, what causes that? It can be too stiff a shock absorber. too stiff on the compression side. Incorrect tire pressure, tires that are overinflated or springs that are really stiff. Like on our travel trailers, our springs are only two inches long and they have a very little bit of movement. They ride very hard. And same thing true on some of the Ford Class C motorhomes. They have a real heavy spring pack that's actually reversed arch from the factory. and they are really tense. They have a lot of harshness in them. So the proper shocks, uh, sometimes we can add on like some, um, sometimes we will use airbags to help soften it up or the sumo springs or super springs sometimes to pull some of that reverse arch out. And since we are an alignment shop, we always recommend having a good precision four wheel alignment. We recommend checking all the wheels on your, on your vehicle. If you're a trailer, we line up everything in relation to the, uh, Hitch the fifth wheel kingpin or the uh, uh, bumper pull mount when we do it. But alignment is very important. Okay, uh, we want to thank you for attending the seminar and we want you to have a better idea of the condition of your coach, know what symptoms to be aware of. And our goal was to give you some of those secrets and things to think about. If you're not sure, we want to connect you to a road performance assessment center, somebody that knows what to do. On our website, we have we totally are into education. We run a school called the Motorhome Steering and Suspension Institute, and we've had a number of people who own RVs said they would like to be able to take some sort of a course to learn more about their chassis. So we're working on that for more of the common chassis. If you're interested in that, please let us know because we are we totally believe in education. My my philosophy is that if I educate a customer, give them the facts, let them make up their own mind. If I give them the facts, they can make a good decision on their own. If they know uh, what what it's for, what it's going to do for them and why they need it based on their preferences and, and their concerns and, and their particular vehicle. So we, we love that. There's also some specials we have with some codes up here. You can see the codes that we're going to have. It's on our village too. So you can find it on there as well. Before I finish, I want to mention Barb and I have written a book together. It's called Living Life One Mile at a Time. And if you send us your email, we'll send you a copy of the first chapter. And uh, it's at the publisher for editing right now. But we, we can send out a copy of the first chapter if you would want it. Robert at Henderson'sLineup.com. Robert, thanks so much for everything. Look, look yeah. forward to scheduling some more in the future. Yeah. Congratulations. Winners there. And we'll... Talk to you later. Take care, everybody.